In the mid to late 90s, the real-time strategy game was one of the coolest kids on the block. Games like Homeworld, Command & Conquer, StarCraft, and Age of Empires 2, among many others, beloved, dominated the market well into the 2000s, with most receiving sequels and expansion packs far after release. But fast forward just a few decades, and the RTS game is nothing more than just Whisper. Popularity and demand for the once classic RTS is at an all-time low, and next to no AAA strategy games have been released for what seems like an eternity, and nearly none are on the horizon. What's worse though, is that not many people seem to notice or care at all. What a shame for this gem of a genre, perhaps its future nothing more than a relic of the past, to be lost in a memory. With the genre heading full speed towards becoming damn near obsolete, it feels like the industry has more or less given up on the RTS. Or was it the gamers? What made this iconic genre fade away into oblivion? Today we discuss the death of the real-time strategy game. Good show, Commander. Bloody well done. Those assault destroyers you just reclaimed are going to be very useful in taking down those island fortresses. The history of the real-time strategy game has a bright starting point. When the RTS became super popular, it was a time of great joy, variety, and great enthusiasm in the industry. It was the late 90s, and the PC, Nintendo 64, and the original PlayStation were pumping out fantastic games like Final Fantasy VII, Donkey Kong 64, System Shock 2, Unreal Tournament, and countless more. Among the giants was StarCraft an RTS game that was released in 1998. StarCraft would usher in a renaissance in RTS gaming that would last far into the future, offering the most approachable format of its kind yet. It took the often confusing, cryptic, clunky elements from strategy games that came before, interfaces, menus, unit selection, economy, etc., and morphed them into a package that was slick, intuitive, and just plain fun and user-friendly. The problem with many strategy games, which plagued a multitude of RPGs at that time as well, was the dreaded barrier of entry. You see, playing a grand strategy game requires an extreme amount of time investment to learning its various systems. When Dune 2 released in 1992, it was apparent that this game had a serious learning curve to it. And the same could be said for 1995's Total Annihilation and Command and & Conquer Red Alert. These were some of the first truly epic RTS games and provided the building blocks for what would come. Large-scale combat, resource gathering, unit caps and supply, research gating, map exploration, so much more. Warcraft and Warcraft 2 saw the potential of these colossal games, and simply made them more approachable. Smaller unit caps made the game more playable, and graphically digestible. The camera was closer, so it was easier to see. There were less menus to flip through, tooltips were used more, and the game moved faster with a cartoon-like art style that would appeal to anyone. But even with all that trimming, the complexity still remained, because it was a thinking game. StarCraft took that idea and ran with it even more. StarCraft offered an amazing three-race asymmetrical strategy game with a full campaign, Battle.net co-op, custom maps, and a built-in map editor as the cherry on top. It was the most fully featured RTS in history. StarCraft was a game about time management, and to this day might be the most complex, demanding, and skill-based RTS game of all time, but it is still so approachable. It may not be the biggest, or the most ambitious, but its top-tier quality, fantastic audio, great gameplay, and infinite replayability certainly make it one of the best. StarCraft would go on to receive one of the industry's best expansion packs ever and a sequel, though that wouldn't come for 12 years. In that time, the real-time strategy market would go through what could best be described as the most perplexing and depressing runs in all of gaming. Highs would be achieved, then years upon years would go by with nothing in sight. Other companies would try their hand at the formula, but nothing would stick. It was a barren wasteland for a long time. The pinnacle of the genre would have to be when Warcraft 3 launched in 2002, only a few years after the success of StarCraft. The space opera RTS would go on to host big tournaments for decades, especially in Korea. Meanwhile, the Warcraft universe would chalk up its third game with Warcraft 3, and then both titles just kind of blew up side by side with success in the mid-2000s. It was an awesome time. Warcraft 3 was successful because not only did it have a good brand behind it, but it was a great evolution from StarCraft. Warcraft 3 introduced hero units, creeps, shops, experience, leveling up, and consumables to the pre-established routine of resource gathering, combat, and base management. Our powers over nature will wane in time. With an incredible campaign, Battle.net support for multiplayer, ladders and custom maps, as well as a phenomenal expansion pack, Warcraft 3 stands alone as the most generous and well-rounded RTS game that has possibly ever been made. And with other treasures like Age of Mythology, Total War, Supreme Commander, and Sins of a Solar Empire all released in the same decade, things were looking up for the RTS genre. 
especially in terms of variety. RTS games had expanded outward in so many directions. Military, history warfare, science fiction, deep space, and even god simulations. During this era, you could have it all with the RTS. But then for some reason, way beyond speculation, the real-time strategy game simply vanished from thin air. Just like platformers, adventure games, point and clicks, kart racers, and isometric RPGs, they just disappeared. Why? Outside the Total War franchise, StarCraft II remains etched in stone as one of the last big RTS games that has been released. There have been a few mid-tier titles peppered along the way like Grey Goo, but as quickly as they come in, they fade away into a distant oblivion. Like fighting games on the PC, they never seem to sell well anymore, nor can you find very many in the indie market either. StarCraft II was expected to be one of the biggest games of the generation, yet its waning popularity has given the indication that even great brands cannot carry the RTS genre anymore. This may be why there are no plans for the development of future StarCraft titles. Why did StarCraft, alongside the entire RTS genre, erase from existence? One has to assume that during these changing times, the business model for the RTS is simply out of date. Most RTS games provide a campaign, full online functionality, chat rooms, custom games, a map editor, and post-launch support for balance, all provided by a single one-time purchase with no in-game store micro-item revenue. Going all in on an RTS with blind faith that it will boom into a successful title is just out of the cards for most. Recently, publishers have developed certain safety mechanisms to curb risk that is inherent in such a prospect. Whether it's with a free-to-play model, subscriptions, cheap development costs, or season-based content, smaller entry fees and incremental purchases seem to work much better in today's cutthroat economy. Having no cost on the upfront breaks down the entry barrier that otherwise bars many people from trying out your game. After all, if you can get people to download a game for free and fall in love with it, chances are they'll throw some money at you here and there for content or customization. Sometimes that adds up to more than the box price of the game. Nobody wants to go out of business, so many game makers simply may have just thrown up a shield and stopped making the RTS altogether. The other problem with the RTS was a lack of innovation. Perhaps the genre just lacked inherent potential, or maybe game companies simply were playing it too safe. Either way, the RTS didn't evolve much through the years. On the flip side, action games, RPGs, and shooters underwent massive transformations on the AAA front. The Boulder's Gate became the Skyrim, Uncharted pushed what action games could do. The continual innovation in these genres alone is easy to see when you compare titles released now and 20 years ago. But compare RTS games across the board, and it's sad to say, but they probably haven't expanded as much as they should have. Again, it's possible that the top-down or isometric view of the RTS limits what can be done from a gameplay perspective. Players need a bird's eye view of what's going on so they can make choices. Certain UI elements need to be on screen at all times like unit frames, health bars, construction menus, maps, and supply counts. So if you want to make a new game that's still approachable, you can't really change too much. StarCraft II tried to push the genre forward by allowing a free-moving camera to some extent, and by providing directed three-dimensional cutscenes and a grand story to boot. These things added some great flavor, I'll give them that, but they were always accessory to the meat of the game, because when the gameplay starts, it's back to the same perspective the same mouse control, the same old habits, UI, and customs. That's not the same thing bad about the RTS, it's a fantastic way to play a game. It just may be as refined as it's ever going to be, given the constraints of familiarity. Did gamers simply get tired of that lack of innovation? Considering the RTS crowd has always been very niche, that's inherently a possibility. Or was it that the RTS simply became unprofitable, leading to a waning library, and ultimately its unpopularity as a direct result? The real-time strategy genre enjoyed a comfy stay with gamers next to isometric RPGs, platformers, car racers, and side-scrolling adventure games. Many of these cult PC classics were so popular that they even got ported to some consoles like the Nintendo 64, showing that there was indeed a huge demand for them at the time. But looking back, it's almost as if the RTS existed as a flash in the pan. Interesting for their time when PC games were beginning to come into the scene, yet lost all traction when the industry shifted in the wake of increased competition and demand for faster titles. One thing led to another, and eventually all would-be strategy games simply tapped out, quietly retreating away into the shadows of obscurity. It's sad to watch a beloved genre come and go, but you know what, that's the reality of life. I mean, is the 90s hairdo ever going to come back? Or Crocs, or Pump Nikes, or Vinyl Records? Probably not. The world has outpaced them and times have changed. Interests have gone elsewhere to different games, and companies have smartly followed that demand. Yet I guarantee a small subset of veteran RTS fans, I am sure, is out there, somewhere in the fog, waiting for their favorite genre to make a comeback. Will the RTS ever make that comeback? 
A select few genres can, and remasters helped give the cause an initial bump in the right direction. The remaster of StarCraft didn't really do that at all, but maybe Warcraft 3 will. But all things considered, I have to say that the RTS probably has the biggest uphill battle of all the genres that at one point died away. Alright, so Darren to be Darren says, when is Did It Fail coming back? What do you plan to cover? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's coming back whenever a game comes out and it's questionable whether it succeeded or failed. I try to uh, cover games that actually come out and then I can assess, you know, the, the aftermath, basically. What happened that was good, what happened that was bad. Can I see some sales figures, player counts, stuff like that? If I can formulate an entire picture with a, a game that's actually relevant, I'll cover it. But given the fact that uh, summer right now, uh, you can expect to wait a little bit for that formats. But thanks for the question. All right, so we got a question on YouTube from Colonel Fagachery. Fa Fagatry? Uh, when are you going to bring back reviews? Um, when we get some games coming out, dude? It's summer. Uh, it's been a pretty boring summer for me, but I hope to cover WoW Classic late this month, though. So check out that when it comes. But for some games in the next couple months, uh, probably like NBA 2K20, Borderlands 3, The Surge 2, stuff like that uh, you can expect on the channel. Thanks for your question as well, Colonel. Last question here from Virgin Airlines 12. Have you ever been a member of the Mile High Club? <laughs> Um, I can't say that I've ever done that on a plane, but um, if you're a member of the Mile High Club, I salute you. Uh, that's quite a feat. I've heard that's, um, you know, limited space to move around. It's complicated. You got to be like hella quiet. Make sure that little Timmy on aisle 13 doesn't hear you. So if you've done it, uh, I applaud you. Achievement acquired. 